Hey everyone, a quick warning. This episode does have explicit language as well as descriptions of violence. It may not be appropriate for kids. After Jack got out of prison in 1985, he says he appeared on the Larry King Live show. And so I went on his show, and the reason that Larry King was such uh, had a career that was so powerful is he knew the right questions to ask, and he would never corner somebody, and he'd never burn somebody. Where Barbara Walters would have peeled you down and torn you apart, you know. This wasn't the only time Jack talked to us about what kind of journalists he expected us to be. Throughout our entire time down in Florida, he tells us over and over again how there are good journalists and bad journalists in the world. The good ones, to Jack, were the ones that wouldn't press too much. The ones that wouldn't try to corner you. The ones that wouldn't, quote, tear you apart. Larry King, Jack made clear, was one of the good journalists. And Larry King asked me, he said, Jack, we were in Miami. Boy, and all the clubs and all the players and all the stuff going on. He said, oh, what an era that was. And yeah, yeah. So we talked with that two minutes. So then the next segment, he said, Jack, what happened in prison that changed your life? What's unsaid there, Larry King didn't ask Jack about the Whiskey Creek murders or about how Jack's story now contradicts every bit of witness testimony from the trial back then. Jack Murphy, it turns out, has left a long trail of contradictions since he walked away from the waters of Whiskey Creek that day. In this penultimate episode of The Sneak, we'll finally begin to follow that trail. My name is Nate Scott. I'm a reporter and editor with For the Win in USA Today. This is The Sneak. Last episode, you may remember Jack's old acquaintance, Sonny Gretsch, talking about the Whiskey Creek murders. You never heard about a uh, a fifth person on the boat, have you? No. Okay. No. I, I mean, and I'm sure the guy, that, the witness on the dock who fueled the boat probably would have said there was, if there was somebody. I mean, yeah. he said, told him everything else. There was a witness. And while Jack had been good about controlling the story now and never mentioned any witness to us in our time in Florida, the newspaper articles at the time had plenty about the person on the dock. Sonny Gretsch had remembered it as a man, but the eyewitness was actually a woman. Her name was Linda Owsley. An article in the Pensacola Herald from July 2nd, 1968 described her as a, quote, pretty brunette. She was an office manager of the Miami Marine test station. In a preliminary hearing, Ousley testified that she saw the boat the morning of the murders, from as close as two feet away. As to who was in the boat, she said there were only, quote, two men and two girls. Ousley, who passed away in 2019, then identified morgue pictures of Terry Kent Frank and Annalie Marie Moan, as well as Jack Griffith and Jack Murphy, through police photographs. I asked Jack about why the eyewitness didn't testify to seeing the unnamed man. And to the eyewitnesses who said there were only four people on the boat, they just, they didn't see him. No, no, there's, there was three. There was me, Jack Griffith, and this guy, and then the two girls. So there were five. Yeah, yeah. Five went out and three came home for supper. But Ousley wasn't the only witness in this case. In the end, 200 people gave testimony. And in all of that testimony, all of those news stories we read back then, there was never once mention of the unnamed man. In fact, we found no mention of this unnamed man anywhere until Jack was well out of prison. The first time we encountered the story of the man was in the 2014 article that appeared in Vanity Fair, the one written by Merrill Gordon. In that article, the unnamed man had a name, though. His name was Rusty. Let's talk directly about the Whiskey Creek murders. This again is the voice of Merrill Gordon. In recalling her time with Jack, it sounded eerily similar to our experience with him. A few pleasant days of him telling stories, with Whiskey Creek hanging over everything, unsaid. In the couple days I spent with Jack, it was really, you know, I I had anxiety myself because I thought, we're having a really good time at some point, we're going to have to have this conversation. And he he and a friend of his were in a, um, a condo owned by this developer, so I went and we talked for a couple of hours, and I had to go directly to what happened. And, um... In Jack's version, um, these two women had stole the securities, and um, 
the the young woman ran out of money. At one point, Jack said they came and they they lived in his place, and he said they began to say, "If we don't get our money, we're going to the FBI." Um, he and I'm blanking on his first Jack name. Jack Griffith. He and Jack Griffith um, took the women on a boat ride. Now, Murph said there was some mysterious fifth man named Rusty, um, and he claims that Rusty was the one who murdered the women, but he did, does acknowledge disposing of the bodies. The version of the Whiskey Creek story that Jack told Merrill, and which appeared in Vanity Fair, was extremely similar to the story he told us. The biggest difference was that Merrill had gotten a name. Rusty. Rusty had been the man who'd pulled the trigger. Like in the version of the story we got, Jack was just an accomplice who helped clean up the mess. He says he was there and disposed of the bodies, but he never says he actually clubbed them, stabbed them, any of the really terrible things that happened to them. As Jack was telling us a similar version of the Whiskey Creek story down in Florida, I kept wondering why he had entrusted Merrill with the man's name, but wouldn't do the same with us. Rusty's name was already out there. It was published in a magazine article Jack himself had bragged to me about. Jack had to have known we'd do our research. Why was he hiding Rusty's name now? Finally, I asked him about it. The trigger man on the boat, this was someone named Rusty, I I read, or no? You didn't read anything. You didn't read any names. Our time with Jack had been totally pleasant up until this moment. When I asked about Rusty, his look changed. I sat back in my chair. He told me I hadn't read anything, and for a moment, I doubted myself. But that was the thing. I had read about Rusty. A few weeks later, in New York City, I told Merrill Gordon about what happened. Rusty is no longer a part of the story. There's no Rusty anymore? There is a, 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 there is a fifth man. Mm-hmm. Rusty's not his name. Okay. Apparently... Vanity Fair got that wrong, according to Jack. Rusty was a different... I, I, I have the tapes of Jack speaking, <laughs> so um, it's always possible I made a mistake, but that was certainly my strong impression from what he told me at the time. Yeah, uh, Rusty is a different person, he says now, and now he says he will never name the fifth man, but the, the fifth man was, uh, I have to read back, but was taken care of by associates of Jack's, and that's why he's never come forward. Jack said we hadn't read any names, but when we pressed him on how the name Rusty ended up in Vanity Fair, he did offer an explanation. There was another Rusty in another case that when I came out of prison in New York, while I was in prison in New York, I'm on a wing with 400 guys and there's only 12 or 14 white guys and we all sit at the same table like during the day when we're we're not working. Perhaps eager to get away from talking about Whiskey Creek, Jack dove headfirst into telling us about this different story, which started in Rikers Island. Jack says he was sitting at lunch, and one of the fellow prisoners asked Jack how he would rob a rich family that lived isolated on a small island. I'll tell you how you do it. You take a boat in or you skydive in there. For Jack, he says, it was just an offhand comment. But he says one of the guys at the table took it to heart. So anyway, this guy gets out of prison, and he goes to the police. He goes to the police and the FBI and in Miami, and he says, I'm waiting for Murphy because we're going to do a score in New York, and we're going to skydive into this place. This is where things get a bit confusing. Jack says that the snitch, the guy from prison who told authorities about this skydive plot, wasn't named Rusty. He says this man was named Catanio. Well, I hear about it before I get out of prison. I hear about it that this guy named Catania is uh, running his mouth and this and that. Well, I get off a plane. I get off a plane. And within three hours, he's dead. And uh, he has an unfortunate accident. But there is a Rusty in this story. And the guy who was on a boat, and the guy who runs a boat, his name was Rusty. That may be where you got the name Rusty. All right, I'll admit that at this point, hours into the interview, I was totally lost. We'd asked Jack about the fifth person in the boat at Whiskey Creek, a man who'd been identified as Rusty in Vanity Fair. 
Yet here we were talking about an FBI informant who told the feds about a supposed skydiving heist. And now Jack was talking about a mysterious boat runner named Rusty, who was there when Catania had his accident. Speaking of which, the accident, it was gruesome. And this guy, Catania, was on the boat and he stuck, popped his head up through the hatch in the first part of the boat, front of the boat there, and there was a rope going by and it decapitated him. Another admission. During the interview, I hadn't even processed that Jack told us about a decapitation. My co-producer Anthony and I talked about it later, and he admitted he too had missed it. We were so lost with the flurry of names and details that Jack was throwing at us, and trying to work out in our heads exactly how we were supposed to believe that Merrill Gordon had confused this Catania story with the Whiskey Creek story, that we totally missed the almost cartoonish death sequence that Jack was describing. Anyway, I've got a 36-page article in 15-page article in Life magazine about that, about that story right there. Later on, we read that Catania story, the one in Life magazine. We couldn't find any mention of anyone named Rusty. I asked Meryl Gordon what she thought about the story we were told and how Rusty had been excised. Forgive the audio quality, there was some construction going on. That is his new version of this of this story, which v- differs from your version, which differs from the version that appeared in Esquire, um, in which... Well, I, I can't wait to hear this part of your podcast because it's new information to me, and I certainly, uh, whether the character's name was Rusty or some other name... I certainly never heard about him mysteriously vanishing. So, um, but no, it's um, it's complicated to have a situation in which you cannot prove or disprove what happened. Mm-hmm. You only can know what happened at the trial, what the accusations were. Um, Jack didn't testify. I don't believe. Um, therefore, his version of events is at that point was not on the record. So. Um, He may indeed be telling the full truth, but we won't know. Merrill is right. Jack never did testify. And I wondered, possibly, if Jack maybe did have this story all along, and no one ever thought to believe him. Maybe the eyewitness had been wrong, and Kenny the cat lied. Maybe Sonny was wrong, too. But then Merrill Gordon told me something else. Jack's lawyer, um, Jack Nagley, basically said he had never heard of the fifth man. Merrill interviewed Jack R. Nagley, Jack's attorney, shortly before he died in December of 2014. And he said, you know, Jack needs to make himself look good. So taking someone's life is a terrible thing. And what, what he saw, what he did, um, how he deals with this, um, you know, obviously emotionally complicated. There was still one big question that we couldn't really wrap our minds around, though. Jack, to this day, will not admit to the Whiskey Creek murders. But with us in that interview room, he had seemed to admit to equally terrible things. In Boston, with the mysterious Catania, with the accident with the unnamed man. Why would he admit to those things, but not admit to Whiskey Creek? I told Merrill Gordon what Jack had said to us about Boston and about the, quote, accidents. And I asked her what she thought. You got a much more colorful version than I did. I mean, Jack did say to me that he had done some, quote, enforcing, but he certainly never spelled out the details of what he says happened. What's so interesting to me, though, is he, he would admit that, but there's something about the Whiskey Creek murders that he still, to this day, will not... They were young women, Mm -hmm. you know, they were young women in their bikinis on a boat trip, not expecting something terrible to happen. And I think it's one thing to maybe to talk or brag about, you know, whatever might have happened with, you know, made men, but to talk about, um, you know, murdering two young women, um, that's a whole different thing. It's not, it's not something that is likely to make an audience feel very sympathetic towards him.
There was something else we would discover about Jack's story, however. It came months after we talked to Merrill Gordon, when I was talking to Jack's old accomplice, Bobby Greenwood. We haven't heard from Bobby G. in a while on this podcast. He was part of Jack's crew in Miami, and he ended up getting into prison ministry, like Jack. Also, strange small world fact, Bobby is now married to Bunny Constantino Greenwood, the former wife of Bishop Frankie Constantino. They got together after Frank passed away. Anyway, Bobby and I were talking about their old crew, and I asked him if he knew Jack Griffith, the other man who was convicted of the murders at Whiskey Creek. Oh, I knew I knew Jack Griffith before everybody. Then, out of nowhere, Bobby said something that nearly knocked me out of my chair. Me and him went up to uh, Boston uh, many, 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 many years ago when they had uh, the Irish mob uh, wars. We, we were involved in that, too. Um, so that was you and Jack Griff. Did Was Jack yeah. Murphy ever involved with that, too? Or No. No, me, just me, me and Jack Griff. Bobby was telling me the exact same story about getting involved in a Boston mob war that Jack had told me. But Jack wasn't in his version. And you guys were called up as as muscle to Boston or yeah oh yeah yeah well we were called up there to do something finally I couldn't hold it in any longer I told him what Jack told me okay I have to tell you Bobby Jack Murphy told me that he was a part of that adventure Bobby paused for maybe half a second well, he might, he might have went up with Jack, you know, because, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't talk about whatever we did. So when me and Jack Griffith went up, you know, that was it. And he could have went up with Murphy, you know, and I don't know. You're, uh, you're being a good friend here, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> I kept poking and prodding, trying to get him to open up on Boston and Whiskey Creek. But Bobby's guard was clearly up. I soon realized why. Well, Murphy told me about you. Oh, you knew I was coming. Yeah. Ah, all right. Well, I tried. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep trying, Bobby. I'm going to keep trying to find out what actually happened there, so. <laughs> okay. You've got your job and I've got my job, right? That's it. That's the name of the game. Jack Murphy started our interview on Whiskey Creek with a story about Larry King, in which he praised King for never cornering any of his interview subjects. The message to us was clear. Don't you be one of the bad ones who does that sort of thing. We learned later in our reporting, however, what happened when Jack did run into a reporter who cornered him. Let's go back to Cocoa Beach, to the surf shop of Balsa Bill Yerkes. Bill was telling me that I'd been interviewed recently by a newspaper owned by Gannett, which is my parent company. Over there, is this the Florida Today incident? Oh, the Florida... No. There's some confusion here because as I was leaving for Cocoa Beach, Jack had made a cryptic remark about an incident he'd had with Florida Today, which is another newspaper owned by Gannett. Jack told me about a reporter there who, in his words was one of the bad journalists. He mentioned that Balsa Bill might remember it. I'm just curious. Oh, no, you mean when I was interviewed? Yeah, yeah, no, or, or oh. when Jack got into it with the Florida Today. Oh, I was there. <laughs> what happened? Well, it was, the guy had done an interview, and now I knew all the reporters. My brother worked at Florida Today. I knew all the yep. reporters over there. I didn't know this one reporter. I knew all the others. I didn't know this guy. And before the article came out, Murph could tell something was wrong. And he went over and he had a couple of words with the guy. And it was, it was kind of funny. And the guy, the guy said, and actually, what all, all Murph said to him was, I think it, it, as I remember, um, you know, I've been interviewed by Pulitzer Prize winners, and I've been interviewed by assholes, (laughs) and I don't see a Pulitzer Prize in your future. 
I'm curious the guy's name. You don't have to tell me while we're recording, unless you want to. You can tell me afterward. You don't remember his name. His name, it turns out, is Frank Donnelly, and we found him in Detroit. So I'm going to start by asking you to introduce yourself. Uh, this is Frank Donnelly. I'm a reporter with the uh, Detroit News. But in 1993, you were with Florida Today. Right. Tell me about your experience with Jack Murphy. Well, I was always interested in doing a story about him, even when I was a reporter for uh, the prior newspaper up in um, Jacksonville, the, the Florida Times Union. And I just never um, got an angle or a chance to to write about him. But when Frank moved to Florida today, he found himself working near Cocoa Beach, where Jack Murphy had decades of history. So Frank immediately jumped at the opportunity to write a story on the infamous local legend, Murph the Surf. And so when I finally got a chance to write about him, uh, things did not uh, go too well with the interview. I mean, he was okay talking about the good stuff. And um, when I started asking uh, toward the end of the interview, when I started asking him about some of the uh, dicier things uh, about his life, then he got uh, angry and, uh, and uh, ended the interview. And then he showed up at your office. Yeah. Somehow, Jack Murphy had gotten past security at the Florida Today office and showed up in front of Frank Donnelly. He just, he's standing before me as I'm sitting at my desk. And uh, uh, so uh, that was uh, uh, shocking, to, to, to put it mildly. Did you feel threatened? Um, not so much. Um, just, uh, shocked more than anything. Uh, he wasn't threatening in a physical way or, uh, any, he didn't even seem that angry. He was just kind of like standing there and then he refused to answer any more questions. So it just seemed like he was there to try to, uh, uh maybe as a way to, to intimidate, uh, uh me. Um, yeah, it's interesting uh, because uh, I don't know if you were able to read the uh, Esquire story about him. We did. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find John Lombardi. I can't find the guy anywhere. But The great feature writer and editor John Lombardi had written about Jack back in 1987 in Esquire magazine. We've spent months trying to track Lombardi down and emailed a few addresses that were linked to him, but haven't heard back. He wrote the, the Esquire story because he pulled a similar thing with him. Exactly. Uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, somebody shows up in uh, his uh, his uh, hotel room and uh, and his notes are missing. And of course, he you know, he can't he doesn't know who it is. But I mean, it's just it's just kind of curious about Murphy and his and his dealings with reporters. In Lombardi's story, he describes how his relationship with Murphy had broken down after he tried to confront Jack about the truth of what happened in Whiskey Creek. Murphy had then shown up unannounced at Lombardi's hotel room and dropped his bags there. Lombardi checked out of the hotel. The next day, Lombardi wrote, my parents in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, my girlfriend in New York City, and my best friend in South Norwalk, Connecticut, all received phone calls from Murphy wanting to know where I was. He went on, my parents are listed, though I never mentioned that they lived in Cherry Hill, but the other two numbers are unlisted. The only way Murphy could have gotten them is from a printout of my hotel bill. Lombardi also wrote that a file that he had in the hotel room on Murphy had gone missing. Part of it was later mailed to him at his home address. There was no note, but he wrote that the envelope was from a prison ministry organization based in Dallas. I had a notebook disappear for three days when I was down in Florida. Wow. Okay, quickly, yes, I had a notebook go missing for a few days in Florida. And I was only able to find it after Jack came into our room to do the interview. My co-producer Anthony thinks I misplaced it and I'm losing my mind. And honestly, entirely possible. I tell you this now not to accuse anyone of anything, because honestly, I very well might have just misplaced it in the room. But to illustrate the headspace I was in down in Florida with Jack, I was paranoid. From your interview, what you remember of him, and, and, and I can't, you know speak on this however you you want as a reporter or as just a human being did, did you kind of 
buy this this conversion of him into a, a saved soul and or 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 how did you how did you read how did you read Murphy because I I haven't quite made up my mind yet. My memory was that no I I I, I didn't buy it at all. It just seemed like uh, you know part of his uh, his mo. Uh, I mean, the way he ended that interview, he was not speaking like a Christian at all. He was speaking like, uh, you know, the old tough guy. So, I mean, I'm not saying he's um, he's still going, uh, that he's going to go out and murder people. But I just don't, uh, he doesn't seem quite the uh, quite the convert that um, I guess um, he uh, uh, pretends to be. Even all these years later, Jack Murphy is still trying to control his story. He and his partner, Dominic Fusco, who you heard from earlier in this podcast, told me they've been pitching a feature film on Jack's life. But they made clear they want to make sure the film emphasizes the right parts of Jack's story. When talking to Fusco, he told me that one of the frustrations of the pitching process was that filmmakers didn't seem to get it. Here's from our phone call. They even want to emphasize the Whiskey Creek murder. And when they know about what happened, really know about it, it's kind of boring, you know, really boring story. So it it doesn't make a good, if you put the exact things that happened to him on the Whiskey Creek murder, it doesn't make for even good filmmaking. I'm curious what what you mean when you describe Whiskey Creek as boring, though. What do you mean by that? Well, if you know, if uh, I'm I'm talking as a director, Mm -hmm. all right, Uh, you. Um, if you're if you like gore and all of that, great. You know that's it, in terms of making a movie, bam, bam, and it's over. And then they have to figure out what to do with the, you know, with the girls, and they and they just got rid of her. Is it? I'm, I'm just saying that, it, you know, it's not a James Bond movie where you spend 15 minutes for having a fight, chasing somebody through a hallway, jumping over a roof, or any of that stuff. And if you knew Jack, and I interviewed a whole bunch of people, people along the way, and I said, what's Jack really like? I asked the questions like you. Is he really a mean guy? And uh, his best friend, he spent five years in one solo. He says, no, Jack is a great guy. Just don't get him mad. Do you think that even at, you know, 83, is Jack still someone you wouldn't want to get mad? No. he's Well, I'm, you're talking to the wrong guy. I don't, I'm not afraid of anybody physically. So. <laughs> Other people might be, but they don't have to be. Is Jack Murphy a good person? Has he changed? It's impossible for me to tell you that. It's also impossible for me to know if the Jack Murphy who confronted John Lombardi and Frank Donnelly over 30 years ago is the same man I spent a week with in December. I asked Jack's friend, Eddie Siebert, the former CEO of Bill Glass Ministries, about this. Do you think there's a possibility that even if he started down on this path for the wrong reasons of, you know, maybe this will get me out of prison that he's since come into the light in a way. Is, is that possible? Well, I think anything is possible. I think anything is possible with the good Lord. Next episode, the finale of season two of the sneak will track down Anna Lyles and Inez Lyles. And for the first time ever, get them to speak on the record about what happened at Whiskey Creek. And we'll also call back Jack Murphy for one final explosive conversation. You're asking a whole lot of stuff that no one has ever asked, and I don't even talk about it. I just want the truth, Jack. Why? Because that's what I do. I'm a reporter. For who? You want the truth for what? The Sneak is a production of For the Win and USA Today. It is written and produced by myself, along with Anthony Pacillo. Our field recordist is Gustavo Moller, and our music supervisor and audio engineer is Claire Morgan of Notterly. Research by Emily Lacaz. Video and image work from Emmanuel Lozano and Alyssa Williams. Our executives are Mark Hyland, Scott Stein, and Kate Gutman. Special thanks to the USA Today podcast squad, Shannon Green and Claire Thornton, and the crew at Wondery, especially our marketing wizard, Alex Carpenter. Additional thanks to the investigative team at the Naples Daily News for their help with reporting. 
and the amazing team at Miami-Dade College's Wolfson Archives who provided our archival footage. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.